never know You never know And this is uh, Free Fall, and uh, you see every Wednesday morning we post a new episode of my Free Fall with David Only streaming playlists. You can hear it on Spotify and direct at davidonly.com. Okay, why should you do that? It's uh, these originally were for a radio show I had, and uh, I just tried to get these things that I would listen to that. I was going to say odd things, but some, some of them are incredibly beautiful. For instance, there's this guy, he's either from Sweden or Norway, Louis, uh, Leo Ida. And uh, his whole thing was that he was an incredible whistler. And he, like he would do uh, classical pieces. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, they play that and... Uh, maybe Brother Bones, who is the guy who does, if you've ever seen uh, the Harlem Globetrotters uh, or films of them, their theme song was Sweet George Brown. While they were practicing, they'd be in a circle and they'd be doing all this jive stuff, passing the ball around. And uh, in the background, you would always hear a version of Sweet George Brown. Do, 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 do. Well, that was the version done by this guy, Brother Bone. So I, I got into this whistling stuff. So you could hear you can hear that on this uh, <clears throat> free fall stuff, and on the same show you get to hear uh, Dylan Thomas uh, reading poetry or uh, Emily Dickinson poems done by Julie uh, Julie Harris, and then that would be followed by. Nashville's own Julie Lee doing a musical version of the poem by Emily Dickinson. I don't know. You might, if you find that that tweaks your interest, uh, go check it out. All right, coming up this week, we head to Florida for the annual 30A Songwriter Festival at the Santa, Ro Santa Rosa Beach, Fort Walton area along the 30A Highway. And I play two sets, both at the Seaside Rep. Friday, January 17th with Mary Bragg and my buddy Amelia White. And then on Saturday, January 18th with Scott Miller and Amy Rigby. And I'm looking forward to both those shows. Those, all those people are really, really good. Uh, next week in, we're in uh, <clears throat> New Orleans. We're presenting new music at the Folk Alliance International on January 22nd and 23rd. Uh, late night private showcases at the Sheraton Host Hotel in addition to our official showcase in the Grand Ballroom on Thursday, January 22nd. And then I'm on this uh, panel, the Wisdom of the Elders uh, <clears throat> panel along, this kills me, Cyril Neville of the Neville Brothers. Yikes! Uh, Gwen Tompkins, who would be the moderator, she's a New Orleans uh, uh, disc jockey and sort of music tastemaker, I would say, and Maria Moldauer uh, and Tom Rush, <clears throat> which <and> the <clears throat> Maria Moldauer sang along with doing big hits like Midnight at the Oasis. She was a singer with the uh, Jim Queskin Jug Band, which I, I used to love that stuff. And then Tom Rush, man, I used to buy those records and just, you know, wear them out. So, uh, I, I think maybe <clears throat> I'm going to be waiting on tables there. That's how I get on that panel. Uh, so, anyway, that's all that stuff. <clears throat> I saw <coughs> uh, R.B. Morris uh, Saturday. He played here in town at the Five Spot. That's his new CD. Uh, going back to the sky, and this is really good. It, their songs are inspired by this trip that he made as a young man out west, and there are just some stunning songs on this. And I, you know, you may you may watch this and go, oh, he's just plugging his friends, you know, it's just a little, I don't know. 
I don't know what you would call it, but no. I'm, when I say something about a CD, it's something that you know I've listened to, and I'm telling you, this is like really good. Okay, so there's that. So I think I'll do it this way. I've been thinking about stories and just the nature of stories and how they work and why they are, exist. And Saturday, I heard the story on the radio. A guy was telling it. And I'll tell you it. It's this fellow's father was a Jew in Poland uh, during World War II and the years leading up to it. And they had to hide away from the Nazis. And they dug this hole in the ground that they would hide in when the Nazis were around. And sometimes they'd have to stay in there for like days. <clears throat> and he, uh, his dad at the time was a young kid, I guess, or a teenager. And he developed this thing where he would just sit there and uh, he would make up alternate universes, parallel universes. They would be exactly the same except there would be certain differences. He'd think of one where he wasn't a Jew and hiding in a hole in the ground, or there weren't <clears throat> any Nazis, so there was no need to hide in a hole in the ground. Or, but he would think of different things that might be going on, and it was just a habit that he kind of fell into. All right, time goes to passes by, he survives the war, and he moves to Tel Aviv, he gets married, and he has a son. And it's now the son that is telling the story. And uh, he's saying his dad got a job, it's kind of like a food truck, I think, that he had in Tel Aviv, and he'd go around and feed people, you know, sell food. And it, and it was all day that he would do this. And he had a routine where he'd wake up at dawn and he'd go to this pool that was in the town. He'd swim a couple of kilometers, then he'd go to work, and then he'd come home. You know, after 14 hours, but then he'd be exhausted. So uh, he wasn't spending much time with his kid. And the, he and his wife were worried about it, so they came up with this thing that the kid would go with the dad to the pool in the morning. They'd drive to the pool and then the dad would drive to work and the kid would get a cab back home. And while they were driving to the pool, the dad would do the old thing. He'd say, hey, let's, let's pretend there's another universe and, it would, and there's, one, there's just one different thing. <clears throat> and one of them, it might be that the sky was a different color or a certain thing didn't exist. One of them was uh, that the kid uh, had gills that allowed him to breathe underwater. And they would just sort of discuss how the world would be if that were the case. Well, uh, the dad loved, one of the things about him is he loved cigarettes and coffee. They were like almost passions. He just loved the taste of these things. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, the dad gets cancer and he's, he's slowly wasting away and the, and now the, uh, the the son is in his teenage years I don't think he could drive yet uh, but they, he would go with his dad to these therapy sessions and he would his dad would go in and talk with the doctors and stuff he, he, this cancer was cancer of the tongue he had like a tumor at the back of his tongue that was blocked off uh, passage to the esophagus. So <clears throat> they leave they, they leave the uh, session with the therapist. They're walking along the street and they, they stop at a corner and the dad goes says, I've never been in that coffee shop but I can tell you right now that is the best coffee in town. And it was just kind of a weird thing to say and they, they go home. And they, there are different times that they go back to the sessions and they, it's like a routine they have that they always go by this corner. And one day the dad says, Listen, let's go in and get some coffee. And the kid says, the dad has been told he can't 
drink anything or eat anything. He's got to get fed through this tube that they insert. Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> and the son says, uh, Dad, you can't, you can't have coffee. And the dad says, yeah, well, you can have coffee. So they go on to this place, and this very pretty waitress uh, comes by and seems to be charmed by the dad or something. The kid thinks, well, maybe that's why we're here, and maybe he's flirting with a waitress. But no, it's, they're just there. And uh, the waitress takes her order, and the kid gets a latte with like a cookie or something, a piece of cake. And the uh, waitress is getting, you know, doesn't think the dad is going to order anything. And then he said, the dad suddenly says, uh, I'll have a double espresso. And uh, the kid just looks at him and goes, Dad, dad you, can't, you can't have that. He says that. Eh. And the waitress goes and gets the order. And the kid is there with his latte and his piece of cake. And he's just kind of looking at his dad. And his dad is just kind of expressionless sitting there with this double espresso in front of him. And then he leans forward and grabs the espresso and goes, and just downs it. <clears throat> and uh, everyone is just kind of shocked. The kid is just staring. He can't believe it. And that's just like this frozen moment where dad puts the cup back down. And then he jumps up and he clutches his throat and it's, he's, the, the tumor is blocked the access to the esophagus so it goes down the windpipe. He's got all this hot coffee in his lungs and he's basically drowning, making these terrible sounds, gurgling, and <clears throat> people around are, you know, horrified. And one guy comes up and says, should I get an ambulance? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's just this chaotic scene. And finally the, the dad just kind of regurgitates, pukes the coffee out. And it's, you know, it's got phlegm in it and all that stuff. It's just really kind of horrifying. But it's out. And then he sits back down. He's totally calm. And the kid is looking at him, you know, wide-eyed, you know. And the dad goes, what did I tell you? It's the best coffee in town. Okay, that's the story. And I just thought about it. That what? Why does that work? And I thought, that that one little moment before the, he starts choking, he and his son are in this alternate universe where the dad doesn't have cancer. And there and it's like this beautiful moment. And I don't know, the the way the story is told, you go, it was worth it. It was worth puking up that stuff for that one little second where they were both father and son in this alternate universe. And it just I mean it slayed me. So I'm um, I thought about stories, so this is kind of a story song. If I ever told you I was once quite the ladies' man My suits were Italian My color vermilion my words soft as satin, the language of love. My life was the movies, and I was the leading man, the dashing romantic, with a touch of the tragic. My profile was perfect And the language was love Yes sir, Mr. Barrymore You must have been something back then They must have been wonderful years And they won't come again Yes sir, Mr. Barrymore For you another. The women were lovely in the flickering Hollywood light. A 
of course there was Garbo, Dietrich and Haro. The look was come hither, and the language was love. And my God, the parties, the nights were as bright as the day. Air smelled like honey, the stars shone like money in the roar of the twenties. The language was love. Yes, sir, Mr. Barrymore, you must have been something back then. They must have been wonderful years. They won't come again Yes, sir, Mr. Barrymore One more on the rocks And this was a gay town As wild and as free as the night We lived with a passion we loved with abandon We were storybook heroes In the language of love What was I saying? And where has everyone gone? Quickly, bartender, pour me another. Better make it a double. One more for the road. Yes, sir, Mr. Barrymore. Are you sure you can make it all right? Yes, the bar's closing down. Better call it a night. Yes, sir, Mr. Barrymore. Let me call you a cab. All right, <clears throat> Barrymore Remembers is the name of that song. And uh, <clears throat> it's kind of, it's almost like two stories. It's like Barrymore and then there's the bartender. And what, how are they viewing this particular little reality? And, you know, I'll leave that up to you, I suppose. Uh, but that's it. I've been thinking about stories. And maybe, maybe you should too. It's always good to have a good story just in case you get pulled over by the cops. All right, I'll see you next week. You never know. You never know. You never know.